Amazing. Hello, good evening, beautiful humans. Welcome to the University of the Underground Whistleblowing Residency. I've lost my little whistle, so I can't blow it, unfortunately. <laughs> but hey, and I can't actually whistle either, so <laughs> I shouldn't be heading this program. <laughs> Um, so I am Dr. Aditi Jagannathan, and I am many things, a writer, a dreamer, um, yeah, a, 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 an activist, a, a warrior, a lover, a fighter, many different things, many contradictory things. <laughs> Um, but I am here to, yeah, to facilitate a beautiful conversation with the incredible Vasundra Mathur, who is she was just phenomenal, you know, um, her, her work encompasses many, many different things. But what kind of compels me about the work that she does is that it's driven from, from a place of justice, but justice underpinned and rooted in a profound revolutionary love. Um, and that is, you know, it makes my heart strong. It makes my heart skip a beat mm -hmm. and it makes me very, very inspired. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of context as to who Vasundra is and the work that she does, the creative polymath that she is. <laughs> so, <laughs> Vasundra is an artist, a writer and researcher based in South London. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> Her work explores creative interventions into archives of activists, artists, and dreamers of all kinds. She addresses questions of the radical imagination, belonging, hospitality, correspondence, placemaking, and community organizing. Vasundra is a bit of a clever club. <laughs> She received her MA in International and World History from Columbia University and the LSC in 2020, her MRS in History from Goldsmiths University in 2022, and her BA from Vasa College in 2018. Her latest project is titled The Imagination Archive, which is so beautiful. <laughs> Let's take a moment, <laughs> which will be launched in 2022 this year. Um, so chapter one of this project is titled Yuri Kochiyama's Open House, and it takes the form of an oral history project in collaboration with Audi Kochiyama. So thank you so very much, Vasundara. Such an honor and joy and pleasure to have you share space, spirit and mind with all of us today. Thank you. Big up, Vasundara. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Aditi. That was so beautiful. And thank you so much for being so welcoming and hospitable and having me here and um, yeah, giving me a space to talk about this kind of beautiful world that I stumbled into um, of learning about the life of this one woman. But I'm gonna kind of start with just, if it's possible, because I'm a bit nervous today for everyone to take a breath together, even though there's probably just three of us, four of us here, but if we could just, take a moment to kind of come into the same space. It's, it's really kind of difficult for me to wrap my mind around us, live, us being in five different rooms, um, but to just kind of take a moment to just um, and yeah, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Aditi. Um, I'm going to um, start by, um, actually, I just want to say I've known about this university since its very inception because one of my best friends from college, Ryan, was part of the first class. And I remember because I, I was one year behind him in school, I would just log, you know, message him and he was like, I'm a, every day was a different day. It was almost like he was participating in some um art themed tv show like <laughs> i was like what do you mean you're at the opera today and you're living on a boat tomorrow and what do you <laughs> it was just the most incredible kind of learning environment and i think it's such a beautiful experiment um and it's just really incredible to be in the same space as all of you i feel like it's almost fate so thank you so much for having me here um i'm also going to be talking about kind of different spaces of learning um, that, are, that were revolutionary spaces that were imagined by people and were and became possible through um, 
people imagining otherwise and kind of thinking out of the box and coming together. Um, and so it's just such an honor to be here. Um, and I just want to say that if you all want to like intervene and make this more conversational at any point or share anything um, or just kind of convey that something I said is relevant to your work, um, I'm completely open to that. Uh, I don't want to just be talking <laughs> at you either. So um, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that this is a space for open conversation and for interruption and critique um, and love. So just feel free to interrupt me, <laughs> basically. Um, and let me just try and share my screen. Um, there we go. Um, I can ooh, play. Okay, after I'm like way ahead. Okay, <laughs> so is this good? Can everyone see um, the presentation? Okay, so um, my talk is called Intimacy Expands Imagination, Archiving Yuri Kochiyama's Activist Praxis. It's based on three years of my work on the Yuri Kochiyama archives. So I was a student at Columbia University working in the archives um, and uh, the oral history archives when I heard, and I just started the semester when I heard that Angela Davis was giving a talk in Harlem about this some community-based activist that I'd never heard about. Um, and I showed up to this talk, um, which ended up being a film screening of this film called When Mountains Take Wing, which is basically a 10 year conversation between Angela Davis and Japanese American activist, Yuri Kochiyama. Um, in the film, I was uh, faced with a different image of an activist than I would have imagined. Yuri was wearing a cardigan. She was 88 years, she's 88 years old. She's sitting on a single bed. Um, surrounded by family photographs stuck to the walls in this kind of jungle of boxes, right? So her archive was, that was her archive. She was living with it um, and she was well known for it. But um, then I got to know basically the story of her incredible life, um, uh, but which I will kind of now kind of get into. But um, I wanna first kind of, I want to first bring up this quote by Angela Davis um, uh, about how radical movements sustain themselves through collectivity. Um, she says, abstract explanations rarely elucidate how political coll collectivities striving for radical change can provide the kind of sustenance that enables human beings to remake themselves so that their individual consciousness is always in dialogue with the collective consciousness. Um, it's important here to kind of figure, figure out where it was that Angela Davis said this. Um, she says this a lot. She's constantly talking about the fact that social movements don't just come about randomly. They are, even though they might seem like moments, um, they are only moments in decades of work um, that organizers and people on the ground have been doing um, that we don't get to see. Um, here she's talking about Safia Bukhari, who is really integral to the Black Power Movement, um, one of the pillars of the movement in Harlem in the 1960s and 70s, and a really close comrade of Yuri's, who she, um, who Yuri started the Jurecho movement to, um, to free political prisoners with. So, um, yeah. The question, which I still haven't answered, which is possibly the most important one, is who is Yuri Kochiyama and where in history does she appear? So Yuri Kochiyama um, was born in 1921. She lived in San Pedro in California. Her father was a fish merchant. And like many fish merchants and fishermen uh, of Japanese descent, um, the day Pearl Harbor was bombed, he was arrested by the FBI um, and taken off um, uh, to a detention camp where he was then questioned um, about 
espionage uh, while his family waited, not knowing where he was. Um, he just had um, a surgery and unfortunately, because of the way that he was treated by the FBI, he succumbed and um, lost his life. So Yuri's first interaction with the FBI was the death of her father. Um, this was followed by the, or the executive order that all, Jap all Americans of Japanese descent or people of Japanese descent from the West Coast were then taken to assembly centers and then to internment camps. So Yuri's story as a political activist, even though she, she doesn't agree to this, she always says she was red, white, and blue before the war um, started during the Japanese internment. Um, now, Yuri emerged in the internment camps as a letter writer, primarily. Um, she started teaching at Sunday schools in the camps and um, basically uh, would spend, started these letter writing campaigns to Japanese soldiers who were at war. So for America, Japanese American soldiers who were at war um, to kind of keep their morale up. Um, she used to spend her monthly salary on 800 postcards a month. So between her and this group that she assembled that she called the Crusaders, funnily enough, um, she was sending thousands of letters back and forth, um, creating what was in essence an energy field of joy amidst absolute times of separation and loss and anxiety and entrapment. Um, and this is something that she would continue for the rest of her life. Um, and so, energy field of joy, <laughs> exactly. So kind of tracking back to my interaction with the Yuri Kochiyama archive, I had a very unique experience because usually when you go into an archive, you're given this list of things that are in the archive with dates next to them, file numbers, and you get to pick a few that you, you know, have the opportunity to look at. You go into this room, it's completely beige or uh, with fluorescent lighting and you have to wear these blue gloves and try not to make too much noise when the paper moves. <laughs> um, but I was given the key to the eighth floor of the Columbia University Library, which to the section of the library called the cage, um, which was the restricted section. So the Yuri Kochiyama collection had not, been, um, had not been archived yet. And I had spent probably three months trying to convince them to let me have access to it um, and finagled my way into a job. <laughs> um, my job was to empty the boxes figure out if figure out what was there. So basically to conduct a very preliminary um, indexing process of the archive. Um, it was an incredibly privileged and lucky position to have, but it really um, kind of allowed me to radically have a very um, intimate experience with the archive. I had no idea what I would find in one box after the other. There was no differentiation between the personal and the political between 1941 and 1976. There were, you know, everything was mixed up. Um, there were love letters in the same file as letters to the police department kind of defending people who had been arrested. There were, you know, so it was a completely different orientation that I had to have towards the archive. But what emerged was also a different historical possibility for me. It was the ability to trace Yuri's practice. So Yuri's activist practice, instead of thinking about a particular moment in time or kind of trying to nail her history down, I was given the opportunity to kind of figure out or engage in the poetics of what her daily life was like um, and kind of try and unpack what she was like, what her presence made possible for other people, um, which is where the title of this talk really comes from. You know, it stems from my intimacy with her and how it 
enlarge my imagination of what politics can be. But her archive is an archive of intimacy. It's the archive of how the movement, the movement here I'm talking is about is like the intimacies between all these different movements, how they were built on intimacy and friendship and care and um, how the co-mingling of all these different energies allowed for um, these particular moments of the 1960s and 70s that we know so well. So um, that's kind of where this idea comes from. But to situate Yuri in Harlem, I'm gonna read a little bit from my writing. Um, so I can ask again, who is Yuri Kochiyama and where in history does she appear? Um, trying to close this chat box, put it in the middle of my screen, I can't see it, but that's fine. Um, ooh, managed to change the thing, okay. Um, so on Malcolm X Boulevard at the address 125th and Lennox, today exists the Starbucks, but from 1903 to 1983, at that very spot, there existed an ice cream shop um, with bright shining lights and a menu replete with complex recipes of overly sweet ice cream sundaes. Thomford's was where Harlem's radicals got their ice cream fix. Um, a longtime waitress at Thomford's, Yuri Kochiyama remembers Malcolm X holding court over banana splits. The slightly middle-aged, always energetic waitress was known well around this part of town. Almost every customer who walked in walked straight up to Yuri Kochiyama. Notepad in one hand, pencil behind her ear, she whizzed around, taking orders for urgent movement information to pass on with a side of ice cream. Jamal Joseph, one of the youngest members of the Black Panther Party and the youngest of the Panther 21, um, recalled Yuri slyly slipping him tuna sandwiches when times were rough. In the absence of phone or email, the budding Harlem activist had begun to function as the quote, internet of the movement. The establishment she worked at at Harlem became movement communication centers and her sharp memory, accessibility, organization skills and vast network became a reliable and much needed resource for black, Asian and Puerto Rican movements taking place in the revolutionary era of the 1960s and 70s. Few would have guessed that a friendship would develop between um, the most famous patron of Pomford's, Malcolm X and the waitress Yuri Kochiyama. And a few years later, a mural would be painted at the same spot commemorating their relationship. In the mural, Yuri stands valiant, mic in hand, speaking to a plethora of different movements, uh, including Black Lives Matter, uh, New Namenos, um, you know, all kinds of global movements in one place. Um, and Malcolm, is also giving a speech. A quote by him is written on the side that reads, the only way we'll get freedom for ourselves is to identify ourselves with every oppressed people in the world. Um, so what is this mural a symbol of? What kind of memory place is the community in Harlem? I know the people who made this mural also. Yuri's family was involved. There were 100, almost 100 people involved in the making of this mural, if I'm not wrong. Um, it's a community effort to inscribe in Harlem public history, Yuri and Malcolm's relationship as a symbol of not only intermovement, interracial solidarity, but international solidarity. Um, and this is not a coincidence. Um, Yuri and Malcolm became friends at a very particular time of his life, 1964, when he was traveling the world um, and starting to kind of move towards what people have called it radical internationalism, radical black internationalism. Um, right before he began his travels, I think in the middle of his travels, Yuri Kochama invited him to speak to victims of the, of the, of nuclear bombs in her house. So uh, he spoke to victims of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombing in her Harlem apartment, um, connecting the, the questions of white supremacy and imperialism that were undergirding his work and what they were trying to talk about by touring the US. Um, and so Yuri kind of became the symbol of internationalism for Malcolm. 
when he left her house, he promised that he would write her family um, postcards. And she's famous for having received these 11 postcards from Malcolm from eight different countries with messages such as, you have the most beautiful family in Harlem. And, um, you know, I'll, I'm, you know, he's basically, he's describing his travels in this really romantic sense, sense and writing home to what was basically started being called Yuri's house, which started being called the uh, Grand Central Station of the movement. So this Yuri's apartment um, also becomes like this really important space, an example of what internationalism in Harlem looked like. Um, this is one of Malcolm's postcards um, to Yuri. Um, uh, and so to understand what Yuri did in Harlem, and what made her politics so radical is to understand her radical hospitality. Um, when Yuri and moved to Harlem with her six children and her husband, right after the, after the war, having lived in different low income housing um, situations, um, they soon joined the Harlem Parents Committee and started attending the freedom schools that were established in Harlem at the time and educating themselves, going to different rallies and protests. Um, and after every um, freedom school meeting or um, uh, the Harlem Parents Committee meetings, there would be parties at the Kochiyama residence. Um, they started being called the Saturday night parties, uh, N-I-T-E. <laughs> Because you that's how you really like to spell it. but um, many described Yuri's Saturday night parties by describing it's their infectious environment so um, I basically in my project um, spent a lot of time getting to speak to a lot of different people who went to these parties um, and managed to kind of draw a little bit of a portrait of what they were like um, and so I'm going to read that out um, Many described Yuri's Saturday night parties by describing the infectious environment. The train clamoring, Yuri's radio always on, loud laughter and the milling of voices, children racing through corridors, kitchen pots clanging, and passionate debates that flowed to the first floor, pulling you up as you climbed three dimly lit stories to apartment 3B. A crowded corridor covered with posters and Yuri's felt-tipped penwomanship initiated you, detailing petitions that needed signing, rallies that needed attending, theatrical performances that needed an audience, and most urgently, political prisoners who needed support. Free Mumia onto Jerecho, the walls incited, pulling you into the fold. Posters of Malcolm X, Che Guevara, Billie Holiday, Mao, and Mumia Bujamal presided over the gathering. As you squeezed through the cl crowd clustering the kitchen's doorway on the left, the small living room appeared on your right. It fit a sofa and a coffee table that was evergreen with food. No number of folding chairs were enough and the crowd almost always leaked out the main door. But if you were lucky, you could cop a spot with Yuri's collection of teddy bears on the couch and bear witness to the conversations taking place main, on the main stage. The Saturday night gatherings often featured guest speakers and performers and Yuri's living room would turn into a makeshift podium or stage the likes of Stokely Carmichael, Max Stanford, Sophia Bukhari, and most famously, Malcolm X had held court there. Almost 80 overnight guests a month stayed at this house. And they didn't just include quote unquote political activists. They also included people who traveled from around the world for medical treatment or, you know, all kinds of dance troops from all over the world, they kind of, it became known that, okay, this is somewhere we can stay. So Yuri's six children got very used to being thrown out of their bedrooms. And Yuri often could be found kind of sleeping in the, in the baby's cot, because um, she was really tiny. Um, so basically, why did I describe that whole space to you? Um, because I think that it's really important to remember that these spaces were so essential to creating and building the imagination of the movement. Uh, I think, you know, questions of hospitality are not just about 
obviously not just about parties and um, you know food and happiness but at the same time they're about they all these aspects of joy and relationality get um, get clouded by the criminalization of coalition that was taking place at the time by the FBI. Um, Yuri's house was a, ma a major target. Her phone was tapped for a very, very long time. Um, there were secret agents at the parties all the time. She would find out decades later that uh, she said, someone who was babysitting the kids one day ended up being an FBI agent, things like that kept happening. But the parties kept going on. Um, and basically, they became a space for Yuri to enact her politics, um, which I kind of break down into three parts here. Um, the first is radical hospitality, the second is correspondence, and the third is memory and remembering. So practice and all of these can kind of be um, put into yeah. practice yeah. through the archive. Um, emerges practices in the archive. Um, this is a quote from the Undercommons that I think encapsulates um, what I'm trying to talk about when it comes to the house. Um, Morton and Hani write, I actually can't read this because I have this chat box <laughs> in the middle of my page, but I think you can read it. It's basically saying that you have to invent the means for the movement by reutilizing space and imagining the po possibilities um, that exist in every little um, space. Um, Yuri's husband, Bill, when they first got their apartment, drew these very detailed portraits of the house. And I say portraits because he labeled every single he said, the sink is leaking and this is the side that Yuri sleeps on. This is the side that I sleep on and we go shower and the neighbors shower. But there's this sense of like romant, maybe not romanticizing, but loving. I think the word romanticizing um, is not enough to encapsulate what I'm trying to do here because I do think that it's important to love on these aspects of this history. Um, love is a complicated thing um, and, you know, trying to, trying to say, oh, it was all roses is not accurate. But at the same time, it's important to kind of feel moved by certain aspects of the, of the movement, I think. Um, this is Yuri's calendar from the 1970s, um, which kind of really, oh, it's a lot to look at <laughs> for me. <laughs> I have no idea how she managed to live her life like this. Um, but uh, in a quote from that time, she says, but I tell you, we were busy during this time. Every week, more brothers and sisters would be arrested. So we were working on scores of cases at the same time, trying to keep up with visiting, writing, attending court hearings. If I could show you all the leaflets we made, you'd get an idea of how expansive the work was. And yes, I saw all the leaflets they made. And I saw all the boxes of letters piled one on top of the other and the posters. But it was almost more difficult for me to imagine how busy they were when I saw all those things because I just didn't, I couldn't figure out how they fit it into one day. Um, and then I saw Yuri's calendar and I said, okay, that's how. Um, Yuri's calendars overflow lists of appointments and things to do in October 1972 barely fit on the page and spill into the notes section as if to extend the hours of every day. Not a single day is left unmarked or unplanned. The month begins with four days of three hour shifts picketing with Black Panthers outside the United Nations. Saturday the 7th is divided between Asian Americans for action and ends with an all day plus night meeting um, of another organization. There's an anti-war rally that ends with an open house where one can imagine all of Yuri's acquaintances from the week from all these different movements coming together and talking to each other. And that's really, you know, what I could start to picture happening when I saw this um, calendar. Um, what's also really kind of remarkable about this calendar is the number of prison visits that Yuri makes and calls to prisons and um, I think, you know, what the abolitionist movement is really trying to point out to is how 
prisons are kind of erased from our imagination of space and time, right? Like this calendar kind of signifies how Yuri is reinforcing there is a prison in New York. I'm gonna go to this prison four times a week. I'm on the phone with someone. I have to write these letters from you know, this time to this time every day. Um, and you know, that I think is something that is visually um, apparent over here in a way that's quite unique um, and really kind of shifts your, shifts your perspective um, in a radical way, I think. Um, also the visible and invisible aspects of Yuri's activism to support uh, political prisoners appears as equally important in the calendar. So people often say that, oh, you know, Yuri was an organizer of the movement, was a movement organizer, and that's the important part of the work, or, you know, now she's holding a mic, but there's kind of this sense that like activism involves both, you know, there is this, this responsibility for you to engage in this rounded, sense of the movement. Um, uh, the other thing that I think is really incredible about this calendar is that on several occasions in the calendar, Yuri talks about healing work. So Yuri was a Reiki practitioner and had a few students here and there, but in, the, in this calendar, she's, she wrote many flyers to alert community members, especially about the physical health of those in prisons. So she, um, she would often say, okay, this person is really sick, so we need to act urgently. This is what's happening. This is what we need to do. And she was the point of contact um, to convey to the movement that someone's ill. Um, so in the calendar, as well as the well-being and health of her comrades appears in her list of responsibilities. On the 31st, she takes someone with her to Mutulu Shakur's Lincoln Detox Center and also reminds herself to draft writing about someone with asthma and back pain at, um, at Mount Morris Park. So she's kind of, um, oh, thank you, Raz, no worries. <laughs> um, so it's the sense of like, this aspect of activism, taking care of your health, which is not very apparent in this calendar because it's definitely not healthy to be working this much. But the sense that like your, you know, the health of, the, of your comrades is a really important aspect of your activism comes forth. Um, but the last thing that I kind of want to point to in the calendar is that the movement appears in human form. Yuri's doing everything with someone else. She's either visiting someone or going somewhere with other people. Um, she's writing to someone, she's calling someone, she's talking about someone. So all of Yuri's activist work requires contact, communication and collaboration. Um, the movement, um, Yuri's calendar records not just that she contributed to the sustenance of the movement and the radical commons, but how acts of commoning sustain her, because you're not just seeing that she's giving energy to other people, but the only way that she could possibly get through these weeks is if that she was she was getting some kind of sustenance from where she was going. So, um, is everyone with me? Are we like, are we good? Yeah. So, um, we're kind of coming to this point of trying to understand what radical hospitality. Um, really means in a very expanded sense. Um, Leela Gandhi in her book, Affective Communities, um, which is incredible, um, talks about this concept of the host friend. Um, the host friend, she says, following the works of Derrida and Levinas must be, quote, ever willing to risk becoming strange or guest-like in her own domain, end quote. She must have the capacity to leave herself open for the asymmetrical other, who constantly calls her being into question. The ethics of friendship and hospitality together make it so that the quote, open heart of friendship or the open house of hospitality can never know guest or friends in advance as one might a fellow citizen, sister or comrade. So what we're coming to is the sense of like, what does unconditional hospitality require? Um, the unconditional nature of Yuri's hospitality is most evident in her commitment to being transformed by those who entered her home. 
As she worked in the movement, Yuri's own identity was extended multi-directionally. Um, she changed her name from Mary to Yuri Kochiyama when she, um, when she swore citizenship to the RNA. Um, she, this was at age 48 that she changed her name. Um, she, um, she converted her religion several times. She converted to Islam um, at, at one point. So it's the sense that in order to really understand this question of hospitality, you have to be willing to be infected, to be, to be changed by others, to, to opening yourself up isn't always, isn't an easy thing. Um, and I think opening your time up, opening your house up, opening your family up, it has, it has consequences. And that's something that, you know, we have to talk about, obviously. Um, and <laughs> that's when I get to this point where, you know, there is also the sense of exhaustion that you get to at some point where she says, okay, it got too hectic. We had to stop the open houses. We had to stop letting people in every Saturday. And when I reached this page in her diary I was just ecstatic I was like oh thank god <laughs> you know just take a moment um, for yourself um, this diary is actually also really interesting because when I'm talking about Yuri being a network builder she started this practice of writing down the name of every single person she ever met and writing something about them to remember by um, this would be in the shape, you know, in the form of guest books when people visited her house, but also in the form of these diaries called Lest I Forget, um, which, are, which are over here. Um, her Lest I Forget diaries also that started during the internment, as you see on the left, um, turned into Lest We Forget towards the end. So it's just when she was in Harlem. So it's the sense that she's moving towards this kind of collective consciousness. You know, I'm, I'm not just remembering for myself, I'm remembering I'm remembering for, um, for other people. And um, I contrasted to this work by On Kawara from the 1970s too, where he too wrote his I Met series, where he too wrote the name of everyone he met to underscore the imaginative aspect of this act, um, to underscore basically, you know, what it, the light it sheds on Yuri's practice, you know. She wasn't just writing down the names of people who were quote unquote relevant to her. She was imagining ways in which she could relate to every single person, even if they weren't obviously relevant to her. And this, this resulted in the collectivity that she was able to establish being one that was very deeply diverse and also, you know, included people that she didn't necessarily agree with. Um, so there. Does anyone have any any response to the to the I met diaries? Yes, we were literally talking about this at the moment because I was showing my diary to Zoe and saying, mm -hmm. Zoe, good luck, you're going to have to go through, you know, stuff like <laughs> that. I think it's such a brilliant and lovely idea to do that, really. I think we should all do that. Absolutely, because you're being, you're being exposed to the possibilities of someone else and being in relation to them and what it offers to you. And writing it down is kind of this way of saying, okay, I'm going to engage in this possibility, maybe if not now, then later, you know, or I want to remember what it, what I felt in that moment. Um, for Yuri, it was very, she, she wrote down your name, she wrote down what kind of things you were interested in, and then she would send you letters related to your work. So if you were, you know, in, you were like a, an, you know, a Chinese exchange student at Columbia University, she'd send you all these posters and pamphlets for different kind of organizations in New York that were taking, you know, that were, uh, that were coming about. And for me, that, that's really interesting <laughs> in terms of her work, but it's more interesting to me, this kind of, the diaries when they, when you kind of see them pile up because there's a lot of them, obviously. Um, she did that for a very long time, um, but, most interestingly, when you're talking about political prisoners, the diaries then turn into files. 
Um, and, you know, lots of people used to say, okay, if you need to know anything about this case, go to Yuri Kochiyama because she's got the file on everyone. Um, and uh, Simone Brown has called this kind of an act of, she's named this sense of surveillance, this idea of surveillance from below. And she plots it as dark surveillance. So um, I kind of see Yuri's practice as that. It's taking the information that people are collecting on the movement and using it against them um, or using it to memorialize the movement in a way that um, is outside of a lens of criminality or subverts and interrupts this lens of criminality. Um, the political prisoner files were really kind of incredible, um, incredibly like poignant and terrifying and sad, but also just beautiful, you know, uh, holders of an entire relationship, decades of relationship uh, in a box. Um, but that's kind of what I think of as the second part of Yuri's activism, is just this, this sense of correspondence and the potential that that enabled in terms of involving people who were being excluded from the movement or being kind of erased from the movement um, and creating what I've called like a groundless ground, you know, for the radical commons to be extended so that no one fell through the cracks, you know, um, which I, maybe that's a very romantic way to look at it, but it's kind of, when you look at the archive, it is kind of a colossal <laughs> monument to, to that. Um, so, hmm, thank you for, for noting that down. Um, I'm just taking a moment to gather myself. Um, so this is where we kind of come to, you know, when I was talking about surveillance, um, Yuri's FBI file, which uh, was much smaller than the FBI file of many of her comrades. Um, but I found it really kind of, interesting to look at um, because I was curious how they were framing her. You know, people re really weren't able to understand what she was doing exactly. You know, she didn't fall under any sense of any kind of category that they could come up with um, because she was, she was taking over the Statue of Liberty for the Puerto Rican, Indi for the Puerto Rican independistas and she was at the same time, building support committees for Asian prisoners and then participating in the Black Power Movement and, you know, supporting theater and how she, she was just a very confusing figure for them. Um, but um, I did not expect to see this photograph of her um, when I encountered this, this document. I, I think I went through it earlier when I first was doing the research and then the second time I've written two dissertations on Yuri now which now hopefully will turn into a book but the second time I I, I saw this photograph maybe they just released it but um, I wrote this response to that. Um, I was not expecting to see her not here though the first few pages mentioned a photograph. Somehow the image made the violation of surveillance real the photograph is unconsenting and Yuri is unsmiling. The image is black and white, zoomed in and passed through a low quality FBI office scanner before it reaches me. It is cropped and encaged in block white with stark black lines like bars bordering it. All nuances disappeared. She is isolated from the people who outside the lens surround her. As typical of the lens of surveilled capture, she she appears severed from her social sphere, rendered singular. Ironically, her relationality is what made, makes her radical enough to be here in the FBI file cabinet. If we watch the photograph with care for its sense, its social life, denying attempts to crop it out, persists as a quote, quiet frequency, end quote, humming softly in her gaze. In her expression and intelligence, can be registered, one that is listening with signature attentiveness and the intention to remember, or perhaps staring off into the distance, lost in private thought. 
making a list of letters to write, groceries to buy. When was this image taken? Was Yuri at home while Bill helped clear dishes in the kitchen, the children bunking together as usual to make room for guests, while a movement leader made a speech or voiced a manifesto over shared plates of takeout? Is this a zoomed in photograph of her televised arrest after unfurling the Puerto Rican flag and taking over the Statue of Liberty with the young bloods? Or was she listening to one of her actor friends succumb to her insistences and perform a soliloquy in the living room? Rather than her surroundings, the photograph is framed by handwritten text. This biometric information attempting to make the photograph legible, a transparent record, places it firmly in the repressive genre of the mugshot, used by police in America as early as the 1850s for the quote, twinned purposes of identification and surveillance, end quote. Yuri's date of birth, her height, her weight, her phone number, her name before marriage, her sex, the color of her eyes, her complexion are all spelled out. Her race is listed as Oriental. All that is left as an identifier of the anonymous agent who is watching her is their slanted handwriting. The context of the FBI file is simultaneously a suppression of Yuri's identity and an imposition of pre-written categories of identification. In this purpose, it is so blinded that it registers the number of photographs it possesses as two, unable to see that they are simply copies. Yuri is serialized. The ID photograph is a document of suspicion that simply cannot register recognition. The makers of these files and images, those who write these files, remain silent, their acts of subjection cushioned by visual markers of quotidian bureaucracy. Buy US savings bonds regularly on the payroll savings plan, the Bureau reminds its faithful employees in the footer of the file's final page. Um, so to kind of wrap that up, it was just, I felt the need to reread the photograph, you know, to kind of figure out whether if you see a photograph in an FBI file, or if you see an FBI file of someone you know deeply or you care for, what you see is completely different than what's being shown to you. Um, and so that's kind of what Yuri's practice was all about, I think, and what her archive does. Um, and the potential that it has to change how we look at the history of the movement, but also change how the movement exists today, the movement for abolition um, and all these different social movements that are intermingling in the present moment while we face so many <laughs> different things. Um, and while we're perhaps more involved than ever in each other's, um, in each other's lives. Um, and so this question of how do you mobilize memory? What's useful about really going so deeply into someone's life, some one person's life? Um, and um, the way I try and understand that is um, after Malcolm X's death, um, his sister Ella Collins wrote to Yuri um, and a quote from her letter was that she said, let me tell you what your beautiful ideas have done for me. And that really struck me. It was this sense that like, let this story be an opening or a pedagogical um, entry point into, a, you know, into today, into how we deal with this moment, these moments of intense isolation um, and division that we're facing in this moment. Um, so that's basically how I interpreted the archive. Um, I'm trying to check for time because I know that, how are we doing on time? So we have, you've been doing this for a very long time. I could end here and then kind of maybe bring up the different points that I, some leftover points if we have any questions, but how does that sound? 
Yeah, shall we do that? Shall we open the, the, the space for discussion and conversation? Absolutely. I just wanted to share also that uh, a large part of my orientation towards this project is built on my relationship with Yuri's daughter, one that I established while I was working at the archives and um, continued through the pandemic. And I've now built a, an oral history project with her that you mentioned before, where I'm interviewing people that Yuri worked with, um, but also um, people who are kind of continuing the work that she did um, today. So it's this question of how the archive continues or how the archive is living um, and how, to, how it's important to collaborate with people that were actually deeply involved in Yuri's life and are, are invested in her memory. So yeah, that was also something that I just wanted to make sure to mention. Yeah, I just, so then maybe yeah, I do have a question. Okay. So um, so Nelly and I, we both never heard of Yuri before. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering. So maybe first of all, how you came across her, but mm -hmm. then maybe the second part of the question is: Do you have like, is there one action which really made her stand out for you in your mind when you're looking back at what she did? Can you think of, is there just one thing or a few things that really like changed your opinion about her? Oh, it's hard because obviously she's, um, she's been in so many different historical moments. What she's remembered the most for is like when Malcolm X was shot and assassinated, she ran onto stage and she was photographed kind of holding him. Um, and appeared on the cover of Life magazine. There's this anomaly in that moment. But also she, um, she's really, for me, it was the quiet moments of her life that I got to, to know because I got to spend time with her alone in the sense that the moments that she spent alone writing all these letters to people um, that no one else was writing to and also developing very deep and complex relationships and having the capacity to hold them all together. Um, perhaps that's the thing that most, um, most impresses me about her, um, almost more than all the different things that she, she accomplished and the organizations that she built um, because um, I just feel like this capacity to be in communion with so many people um, and the energy to do that uh, is really quite incredible. Um, so yeah, I guess, I don't know if that answers your question, but in terms of how I came across her, it was a funny story. I was asked to sing for Angela Davis while I was in college a month before that. She came to give a talk at Basel where I was in school and then told me that she was giving a talk on Yuri Kuchiyama. Um, or I, either she told me or I found out, um, but we had a conversation about the history of social movements and like women and social movements. And um, uh, then I, I went and heard Angela Davis talk about Yuri and came across this film and then started working on her archive at Columbia. Um, so it was a very, it was a very different way of meeting someone or coming across someone than um, is usual, I think. Yeah, I just want to quickly say, Vasundra, honestly, I'm just so blown away. <laughs> I'm really, yeah, I'm like really moved, like deeply moved by, by the care that you embody mm. and the care that it's funny so I think what moves me about Yuri is the care the kindness the vulnerability openness and tenderness she embodied when she engaged with all these different people these networks of people that mm -hmm. you allude to and that you talk about and it's so interesting because that reverberates into you Mm. How it permeates into your consciousness and it affects the ways in which you engage with her and the work and also mm -hmm. your kind of perspectives and perceptions on movement building right mm -hmm. looking at the quotidian the everyday ways mm. in which we can embody radical change mm. and 
And it's interesting because, you know, when we're talking about whistleblowing, the kind of, the very hyper kind of masculinist Mm -hmm. Um, iterations of revolution or radical change Mm -hmm. are the things that often get remembered in history right but I feel like what you're doing is kind of rupturing that you're refusing that kind Mm -hmm. of place and you're moving into a deeper space actually and Mm -hmm. when you're talking about sustenance as well it's like yeah what sustains the work that we do you know and you showed us her calendar (laughs) I mean, my calendar is nowhere near as busy as that. Like I have two things. I don't think you I know. have two things to do in a week and be exhausted. <laughs> you Having know? spoken to her family, it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it wasn't really good for her. You know, they kind of wished that she had spaced things out a little bit for her own health. You know, mm. and that, I think that's what we're learning now in terms of things that we can change about how we live our lives and especially I think after the pandemic we all have this limited capacity or we've be, we've become more sensitive to what we need in terms of refilling and nourishing ourselves but she also seems to be getting nourishment from so many different sources like transfusions of mm. just connection you know that I think was so was so inspiring to me or maybe that was something that I was yearning for too um that Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate it. No, it's it's very it's it's beautiful. It's beautiful to see someone engage intellectually, but with so much heart. Mm. You know, um, it's it's very very rare. You know, yeah, it's it's so really it's really rare to kind of bear witness to, um, and that's why it's so precious. So, thank you, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, thank you for having me. Of course, of course. Um, did anyone else want to? I think we have a question. Yeah, I want to chime in. Hello. Um, I have to just back up like everything Aditi said oh, um, and second that because, yeah, that was such a beautiful work, engagement with her work. And you obviously embody so many of the same kind that energy I could just oh, thank you so much. That's the best compliment anyone could ever give and- me. I finally, GT, <laughs> you say that about Lucindra, but like that's also because you you see that in each other because you mm-hmm. are also someone who that's a, you know an academic and intellectual who approaches the work with so much tenderness and care, and I think you you know that reminded me of uh, yeah, just both of you. I feel like our kindred spirits, <laughs> and yeah, just um, I just about I'd love to ask a question about the the care aspect because um for me I I know I've known about Yuri Kochiyama for a while just because um actually through I'm of Japanese descent um and I've always been interested in the intersection of community building of what allyship across the spectrum really looks like and Yuri and people like Grace Lee Boggs etc's work have always interested me and um but the culture of how they care for themselves that conversation you know I feel like I've never really been able to hear hear I I guess I I think me and Aditi have talked about it like Angela Davis talks about her yeah her yoga practice or you know how she cooks for herself or these things but yeah, who who cares for you when you care for everyone else? And like looking at that diary also gave me anxiety of like, oh my God, like when did you breathe? When did you eat something? Or, you know, just when also the care and the after work of having everyone at your home and, and like this kind of you, the work is so amazing because there are no boundaries almost, you know, every it's like you're in the home, you're in each other's intimate spaces because we know that that's where it starts and that's where the most powerful conversations happen but how often you know so many activists you know how they run themselves into the ground and there's no they don't know how to care for themselves so the Reiki thing I've never heard which I think is so interesting so I would love if you knew anything more about that I learned Um, a lot about healing by reading the archive wow so how I also, in my podcast, I'm going to interview um, 
one of Ke Keisha Budridge, who was Reiki, who was Yuri's neighbor, and she was her first Reiki patient, and her granddaughter's best friend. Um, mm -hmm. Or D. Yuri's daughter, who's the most brilliant person in the world, in like my my fairy godmother. She's incredible. But she has curated the list of people who I've interviewed, which is why it's such an interesting combination. It's like, okay, what aspects of Yuri's activism don't get talked about? Okay, let's talk about all these other people who, mm -hmm. thanks to Yuri, are now doing abolitionist work. Mm -hmm. But also let's talk about, you know, this person who's received treatment from Yuri and who Yuri's loved and let's, you know, and, and I think that's, I've interviewed Eddie Zhang who um, was incarcerated for 16 years and then took over the freedom campaign that Yuri and several others started for him and led that for many years. So it's just thanks to this kind of community of care that is continuing, um, I've been able to have the most amazing conversations and all of them have centered around care and tenderness and how that's such an important part of being able to do the work amidst such difficult circumstances. Um, but also because that's why we're all alive. And um, in that conversation with, with Angela Davis, Yuri says, she, you, Angela Davis asks her, so what sustained you, you know, like what made you want to keep going um, in the midst of all of this? And she was like, the people, they're infectious, you know, like, you know, movement people are infectious. Um, the people are movement people, you know, this is this kind of sense of who gets to be a movement person and who gets to be an activist um, or who gets to be called, who gets to be called a part of the movement, but also I mean, that's a complicated question in itself, but. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. How we it makes me think of this. I was listening to this conversation with Ocean Wong mm. um, and he, in the interview, he got asked about like, if you put a, in a time capsule of, of this moment in time this year, you know, like and sent it off into the distant future, what would you put in it? And his answer was so interesting. It was really, but he talked about, um, like the important, he would put something like the importance of how, care, of care, or discuss the importance of care in the time capsule because he was like, life is only, seems like it's becoming more and more difficult. And, you know, between the pandemic and all of these things and as, as yeah. life becomes more chaotic, care becomes more important. And, and again, I would just, it was like this, this, answer that I wasn't expecting from him but it was, it was so interesting um it's so interesting that you mentioned like mentioned this I keep thinking about the first time I proposed this project and the way I talk about it I can't but talk about it like this because to be honest the reason I was drawn to Yuri Kochiyama was because she reminded me of my grandmother mm. you know and my grandmother she's just you know, she took care of us. That's what she did with her life. She took care of herself and she took care of us. But there was something about how she made you feel so special and important mm. that I always thought was deeply political. You know, that there was like deep political potential in, yeah. in seeing someone for who they are, like for their special personhood, you know? 100%. Yeah. And that's kind of what I was trying to articulate. And it's hard to be taken seriously when you're trying to do that because you can't but use this kind of effusive language. Of, you know. Yeah, especially just, I think, the kind of the, the colonization of like wellness culture and all of these exactly. things make like healing and stuff that's like woo-woo, categorizes like woo-woo or whatever. Exactly. <laughs> But yeah, you know, while you're while you're saying something, sorry, I'm talking. No, I, I'm loving it. While you're speaking, I, for me, why Yuri Kochiyama is so interesting is like, like, and still such a radical person because coming from a Japanese background, I was born and raised there. Like, mm -hmm. Yuri Kochiyama would still be radical now as a Japanese yeah. woman. Like, it's as an American so, too. As, but but especially in Japan and like there's something about that the Japanese lens and context that like mm -hmm. like you know like we are taught to not speak 
you know, to never complain, to never bring up, like to not be pro quote unquote problematic, to make oneself small, like that is so embedded into the culture. It's like, you know, the conversation on gender, sexuality, everything is still, you know, I would almost say 50 years behind what we're having, you know, as probably like it's, it's so deeply embedded still. And like for her to have been who she was, so fearless, so vocal, like mm -hmm. it's so it's so wild to me. You know, this was sm very small pack of Japanese women at the time of artists. I was like, even Yoko Ono or mm -hmm. Yayoi Kusama to that extent, or just like that generation. There was like, I don't know, there you know, there's a handful of women that to me as as a Japanese woman I'm literally like I still you're still so I can't even believe that even happened you know I can't believe that even happened too and I think there's two things I would want to say to respond to that it's like it's often people often say that the re reason Yuri was able to do the work she did was because she made herself really small and she made herself really quiet and I often think she like you know but she didn't let people know that she knew, you know, or she she made it so that people felt really comfortable around her, you know, which is really the sense of like, is there only one way to be loud? Is there only one way to be, you know? Take up space, yeah. Totally. Exactly, and it, it's really interesting. I, and in relation to what you're saying, because there were all those narratives and then she kind of, you know, towards, she, in, in all her letters, she's absolutely very vocal and she's very vocal in her practice, but just in her demeanor, you know, there was this sense that I got. Um, and then oh, the other thing I wanted to say, which now I've forgotten. I'll, tell you. <laughs> I'll, I'll think about it. Thank you so much. I would love to read your <laughs> one thing and then the other thing and then the other thing vanishes into the ether. <laughs> It'll come out when it's supposed to. <laughs> when it's ready. Thank you so much. I really loved lo I'm gonna like watch this again and read all the work thank you oh, so thank much. you that's that means so much to me I've never done such a long talk and I'm always really nervous before them so it's just really incredible for it was me flawless it was amazing loved every second of it <laughs> thank you so much incredible incredible presentation yeah. thank you so much so you, much, really. you didn't yeah. seem nervous from, oh, from thank you <laughs> my legs were like shaking <laughs> And it's been three years working on this project. So it's just like, oh, will I be able to convey how much I care about it? And I think you can't convey everything you've learned, but if you convey why it's important to you, I think that's the most important thing. I'm happy it was you they let into the archives. That's all. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much. I let Audi know that you said that. <laughs> I'm learning how to say inspiring things to people by listening to these calls. <laughs> I'm like learning how to be inspiring by listening to everyone's comments <laughs> to, to the talks. It's really nice to hear so much positivity. Mm, we need it. Yeah. And, you know, Vasana, I, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but um, yeah, there's it's interesting because my work kind of looks at the intersections between like different movements and mm -hmm. music and cultural production mm -hmm. and there's so even though you don't name it there's or maybe you do like deeper in your work but there's so much of a kind of musicality a poetics of music right um there's a jazz you know mm -hmm. in in the ways in which you talk about Yuri but also with the ways in which Yuri moved as well mm -hmm. which you know I'm sure living in Harlem at that time like mm -hmm. that that kind of energy was everywhere right um and yeah and she was in it you know she talks a lot about how important art is to the movement mm. um i was actually going to show a clip from the film but then i didn't know if i was allowed to do that it's it's online um when when mountains take wing but she talks about she says you know angela davis says oh um you know, people used to think that artists were just entertainers in those days. They didn't actually consider them to be part, you know, like activists. Um, and then Yuri says, yeah, but Malcolm, Malcolm always said, which is what she says, you know, that 
those who can communicate are the ones who are the most dangerous and like mm. communicate really complex things, you know. Um, and you used to have performances in her house. So, you know, amidst all of this stuff in the living room, there was just music, there was music all the time. Mm. Um, and drama, a lot of drama. So it's really, it's really incredible. Um, it's definitely very jazzy <laughs> as yeah. a story. And it kind of makes me think of Mary Lou Williams, um, the pianist, yeah. and how she would always keep her front door open for mm. anybody and everybody in the neighborhood to come and learn to play keys. And I think the Alonius Monk, you know, learned, and so many other amazing um, pianists kind of were cultured within her home space. She mm. donated like kind of, you know, a, a sizable portion of her income to help, you know, homeless people, people who are addicted to different types of substances. And mm -hmm. yeah, again, there's, there's something about the role of women, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of silent labor, you know, of women and how, you know, black women, other women of color, like they sustain these exactly. ways of being, these ways of working. And, you know, exactly. in Mary Lou Williams case as well, like she wasn't, you know, someone who was acknowledged as being kind of hyper-political. Mm. You know? But there was a way in which she moved that kind mm -hmm. of embodied that and spoke mm -hmm. to that in such kind of, in such lyrical and potent, explosive ways. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's, a, that's a, such a beautiful connection. And also, I mean, it's really important to say that Yuri's teachers were all black women in how, you know, in terms of how to move around the movement, you know, mm -hmm. and how to get the movement to keep moving. Um, you know, they were doing the groundwork for years before dealing with the prison industrial complex and doing this emotional labor and also, you know, creating systems of, you know, of communication with political prisoners and being the, or just people who were incarcerated and being the connect, connecting points, you know, and that's deeply imaginative work to be able to imagine that people can come together in in you know a situation where there's the radical commons is being attacked is under constant attack you know that's a deeply imaginative act you know oh vasindra i'm sure i can speak for all of us like literally listen to you talk for days <laughs> it was such a lot You've got such a beautiful voice as well. <laughs> Very soothing. It is, Thank you. isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, and you've been singing since you were a baby. It makes so much sense. <laughs> and your grandmother taught you, which also... <laughs> yes, I bring her with me all the time. Oh, the chorus, the chorus of, of, of women who've raised... Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, Vasundra, thank you. Thank you infinitely for blessing us with your wisdom. I can share my email too, so that if people want to keep talking, I really would love to keep talking. <laughs> and to collaborating with people and doing things together and all kinds yeah. of stuff. So. Yes, please. And I'll share your email with the other students who, who couldn't be here as well. Um, yeah, wow. I just feel like, you know, a kind of... Uh, a wind of like kind of beautiful transformative generative energy has like kind of <laughs> flown our way <laughs> and through zoom yes. feel this. <laughs> it's it's phenomenal um oh, everyone please let's thank the incredible vasindra oh, thank, thank you so much thank, thank you. you so much honestly such an honor to have you here and please let's continue the conversation Absolutely. Next time. Till next time. <laughs> Have a great evening and take care of you. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Zay. Big, big love to you. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you. So nice to meet you. So nice to finally meet you, Nelly. <laughs> I was just chatting with Ryan on WhatsApp, saying to him how amazing you are. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's so nice. Ryan's like, such a star in my life. <laughs> it's good to meet you all in person sometime soon. So.
absolutely. Uh, we hope so too, definitely. Are you in New York? You're in New York. Oh, I'm in London. You're in London. I'm in London. I mean, you have to come and meet us then. Absolutely. Like a, a, a party, I think, at the Village Underground on Friday. Oh, where brilliant. I'll be there. <laughs> on next Friday. They're doing some kind of seeding uh, experiment up there. Oh, so brilliant. it's more than welcome to visit us as well while we are, well, this is something. Yeah. Yeah, you are going to be there. You have to put some seeds on this roof, apparently, for the flowers. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> oh, yeah, come and seed with us. I would love to come and seed with you all. <laughs> Yes. Um, okay, we love you dearly. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.